I'm one of the Exceed uh, co-architects, and uh, also in SDNI, I'm the uh, uh, resources or what's called execution management um, director. So it's a beautiful spring day here. I hope you guys are having a beautiful spring day as well. Today, what I want to do is um, explain how the Exceed architecture is designed to uh, interact with uh, gateways and workflow engines and um, and tools of that nature. And I'm going to try to um, do this um, fairly quickly so that we have uh, time for questions. Um, so I'm going to go to the first slide. This is sort of the usual thing. These are some quotes that have driven a lot of our work uh, about give, getting simple abstractions and making them more reliable uh, and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and go to slide three. So this, this talk is intended for uh, end users or, in this particular case, application and gateway developers who want to learn the basics of execution management services. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the basics of a service-oriented architecture, um, that you understand the concept of path names, you know, to name resources, um, and you're familiar with queuing systems. I think with this crowd, this is a fairly safe set of bets. What I'm hoping at the end of this is that you'll under, I should have changed this slide a little bit, that you'll at least understand how one can submit and manage jobs um, uh, in the uh, Exceed EMS, and that you'll understand some of the authentication basics. I added that because uh, when I'm talking to uh, <coughs> folks in Exceed land, I usually get that question. So we're going to start with just a little bit of background, then the authentication basics, so we can get that out of the way, because otherwise we'll just get questions every time, and I just want to get through that. And then into uh, EMS. Okay, so one of the things that I did, Marlon, is I created this slide with a set of links to things that people might want to have uh, going forward. The first is the Omnibus um, Reference Manual. Um, that's odd. Where did it go? Um, and I'm going to... Uh, that's not the one I wanted. So um, the Omnibus Reference Manual is off of the documentation page in Genesis 2. It's also somewhere in the Exceed documentation. I find it difficult to get. This is the 130-page you know, document. You don't ever want to read cover to cover. It's basically designed to be a reference, and you can click to the things that you're interested in, like execution management or starting a job. Um, the uh, other one is there's some online tutorials. Um, which uh, some people find uh, useful. Um, the, in particular, there's a set of uh, tutorials on how to uh, install the, uh, downloading and installing the installer, the basics of GUI. If you want to install a container and what that means, uh, how to do that, how to move things in and out, and how to run a simple job. So these are some um, uh, videos you might be interested in. Also, in the Exceed namespace, in the GFFS, there are some um, sampled, uh, what are called JSDL files and GGP files. And so right now, I just popped up in the GFFS browser. Uh, this is the root of the namespace. I'm going to collapse some of these. Um, if I go into the bin directory, there's a subdirectory that's available to anybody in the GFFS with some grid job tool files, which will make more sense in a minute but also some sample JSDL files. So for example, um, here's a, you know, to run a simple JSDL, uh, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted uh, oh, I've got to just pick one, another one. This is a JSDL file. We'll be talking about JSDL later, um, but if you want samples of stuff, all this stuff is available online. And then finally, <coughs> where you can get installers uh, that are good, that work with Exceed, um, and then finally, if you really want to dig down deep, there's the links to the um, architectural documentation. And I don't expect anybody's going to race out to read these things, but I just thought I'd, I'd uh, show you where they were. So later, if you're trying to find them, that's one way to do it. There's a number of resources that are accessible via, via this right now. There's the, um, at the seed, there's the PSC, um, there's Blacklight, TAC, is Stampede, IU, there's Mason. SDSC has been available before. Um, they took it back out. It's, it's basically, if they have somebody who wants to use SPSC, I think it'll go in. And then there's some Exceed Campus bridging resources that are um, going to be coming online, and we'll talk about that later. So let's let's sort of uh, one more background thing. Um, a note on versions. 
The current exceed production grid is, we call it the 126 grid because it's from the SDI activity number um, that uh, produced it, and that was almost two years ago. Um, if you want to use the production grid, you just need to send a ticket is in with your. Is it possible to collect some sort of like uh, data metrics? Excuse me? I think somebody needs to be on mute, so go, go ahead. Oh. Um, the exceed production grid um, is what I'll be showing everything on uh, today. We call that the 126 grid. Uh, if you want your exceed identity to be activated, um, you just send in a ticket and we'll um, activate it, and then you just use your exceed username and password to, uh, to do whatever you want. Exceed 149 is in testing right now. Um, the uh, I'll be showing you a 149 client. The 149 clients interact with the 126 grids without any problem. So the differences between the two don't affect any of the discussion um, going forward. But there are multiple versions in play because it's hard to get things moving sometimes in speed. So one more quick thing on identity and authentication in, in execution management services, and then we'll get into the the basics of it. So we're using in, in execution management and in the GFFS as well, what's called a credential wallet mo model. This is an old model. Um, the basic idea is that you hold a set of certificates, not just a single <laughs> certificate. So you start with a session certificate, which is an X.509 certificate. And if you don't, and you can specify one or it will generate one for you, a self-signed cert, which is not what Exceed wants to use. In the Exceed case, you do what's called an Exceed login command, and it will ask for your username and password, and I can show you guys this later if you're interested. And there's an API for all this as well. Um, and, you, and what happens when you do that is the session acquires a MyProxy certificate. At the end of it, you have a MyProxy certificate and a set of delegated SAML assertions for identity and group management. And I'll show you what that means in just a minute, uh, group membership. There are Andrew? Commands to, yes. Uh, can you can you say what is this uh, 149 and 126 are? Just before you go. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Um, so SD and I uh, numbers all the things they do with activity numbers, and so that you can track their progress and the documentation trail and all of that. The 126 grid is the grid that's in is named for SDI Activity 126, which defined the namespace or the directory structure, if you want, that Exceed is going to use, that they wanted to use. It's different than the namespace that we've been using. And so we call that the 126 grid because it's the code base that came out of that SDNI activity, and that's been through the whole process and is installed. <coughs> um, well, is installed the at, I think they're at Indiana and Illinois or where the, the core servers are, but then that's what hooks up to resources. So we call that a 126 grid. It's that version. We also then say there's a 149 grid, which is a different integrated um, one, which has passed through all the SDNI stuff and has passed the ORR operations readiness review. Uh, yeah, operations readiness review. Um, no, it's past the TRR, the test readiness review at, in operations, and we're waiting, and that did that about a month ago, we're waiting for them to complete their tests. Then we'll upgrade the production grid from 126 to 149. So they're just, they're essentially version numbers is the way to think about it. Did that help explain it, or is it just more confusing? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, so there, there are some... Uh, there are some details that I think maybe is beyond the scope of this presentation. Yeah, it, it really isn't that important. It, it basically, I, I just wanted to be clear that the depending on which version you download, you're going to end up getting different clients. And the, all the clients work with all the back ends, though. And I'm going to be using a more recent client if I show you anything, not an old client. That's what I was just trying to make clear. Okay. Okay. So the credential wallet model is that it's just like having a wallet with a lot of cards in it. Um, you can add more credentials to your wallet at any time, and then you get a fatter wallet. 
or you can take them out if you don't want to disclose to uh, uh, parties that you're interacting with that you have a credential that says you're a UVA professor or, or a credential that you're something else. So it is like a wallet model. You can t take them in, throw them out. It's completely up to you. You can list them. You can do all kinds of stuff. <coughs> The uh, wallets are kept in something called a calling context, um, which uh, a copy of which is going to ke be kept on disk um, for you. It does, well, the default behavior is to um, you can have multiple contexts. You can also then add generate if you guys wanted um, your own groups and identities, um, uh, however you want to manage those and put those credentials in your wallet or take them out. Exceed though, if you're going to do that, requires that you have an exceed identity, uh, and in particular that your session certificate be an exceed identity, in other words, a my proxy identity, if you're going to run jobs on the service providers. Um, other credentials that you have could be useful for other things like file staging or whatever, or other non-exceed resources. So for instance, if you want to run on the campus bridging um, queues uh, machines, you will need a, a campus bridging credential of some kind to do that. So here's what it looks like, and I, I took basically a session that I had once. You, uh, and I'm going to use examples using the command line tool because it's, I find it's a lot easier than dealing with all the syntactic baggage of, uh, of using Java interfaces. So I can do a grid exceed login. I've passed in my username. I've elided out my password because you don't need to know that. And what's going to happen is it's going to go to my proxy. It's going to get my my proxy certificate, and it, then I do a who am I, and it's going to say, well, you know, there's your my proxy certificate. This, is, by the way, is not on the detailed level view of these certificates. And then I have a set of, uh, I have my uh, an exceed identity certificate, a tutorial group certificate, and a GFFS users certificate as, that are group certificates that I also have. So whenever I do anything from here on out, um, I would be doing it with this set of credentials. And that's all you need to do to authenticate and log in, and then you do stuff. <laughs> so that's why we call it a credential wallet model, because you can have these additional credentials. You don't just have one. OK, let's talk about execution management. OK, in general, execution management is remote execution of jobs. Um, and you need to be able to specify what the job is. Um, I'm going to use the word job instead of the, the, the standard says activity, but jobs I think is more intuitive. Um, you can send a job to what's called a basic execution service. I'll be explaining that. Or you can send it to uh, a meta scheduler or something else. So <clears throat> in Exceed, a job is pretty much what you guys think it is. It's a unit of work. It's like a PBS or an LSF job or anything else. The program that you submit may be a sequential program, a threaded program, it could be a hybrid GP, GPU program, or what I think of as traditional uh, in parallel using MPI. The programs can be command line programs. They can be shell scripts. Um, they can take zero or more parameters. It's, it's pretty much, I think, what your guys are used to. The job can specify in its description a set of files that are going to be that sh should be staged in before the um, program is run, and post execution they should be staged out. The things that you specify can include executables and libraries. In fact, that's a pretty common thing to do: is to stage in uh, executables and um, library uh, digital libraries of various types. You can also specify that the thing should mount particular file systems. One of the more, more interesting ones, of course, is a scratch file system. Because you can have things hang out in a scratch file system. So you could have, if you're doing a high throughput computing problem, let's say, you could have the uh, uh, JSDL, the, the job submission, say to stage in this big library if it's not already present. Okay, And if it is present, then uh, it won't stage it in, so that you can keep things in scratch. Um, the job description can specify the resource requirements, such as it needs to have this operating system, or this library, or this much memory, or this many CPUs. Once again, pretty standard um, job matching uh, criteria. The job definition can be for a singleton job. I want to run this MPI program once. It's, I need 256 cores, blah, 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 blah. Or I can say I want to run 
um, a parameter sweep of some number of jobs and some number of, of dimensions, um, and it will generate um, all of those jobs for you and run them. So I could I could submit a, a, a parameter sweep that requires 20,000 job executions to run, each one of which could be either sequential or an MPI program, and it will dutifully grind that out for you. So how come it's not going down, page down? So jobs are executed on things called basic execution services, and you can think of this as being similar to a compute element in, in G-Lite, if you're familiar with that. A BES is a standard um, component that um, sits in front of a particular compute resource. And so I think of them as fronting or proxying that compute resource. And they are the things that you give these job descriptions to, and then they handle the staging for the job. They take care of monitoring the progress of the job uh, all the way through. And they maintain the job state, which is something you can query later. And you say, what state is this job in? And it could, might be running, it might be staging, it might have failed. And so you can query what's going on. These compute resources can be pretty much anything. It could be a workstation, it could be a supercomputer, it doesn't really matter. The BESs have a set of resource properties which you can query and interact with, um, such as the operating system, the memory, the number of cores, scratch, and they can, these can be used for matching and typically are. Okay, so, so far I've defined at a high level two things, basic execution services, which are things that execute jobs, and job descriptions, and now I'm going to give you a simple picture. This is a really simple UML that describes the, the typical things that are going to happen. A client, and by a client, I could it could be actually a gateway or a workflow engine, but it's something that's acting in the role of the client, wants to run a job. In the top line of the picture, the client, and I happen to say in this case, it's a Genesis 2 command line client. It could be any other client. It's not a requirement at all. Is this going to make a direct call to a um, a uh, unit? Well, in this case, a Unicore Six could be any basic execution service, and say, "I want to run a job," and that would, might be at NCSA. So that's one model. The client in directly interacts with the basic execution service and says, "Here's the JSDL. Go do your thing," and it will do that thing, and it will interact with the BES to find out what state the job is in, um, either by polling uh, or by subscribing to a notification. Alternatively, it can interact, and there's a more general pattern that you'll see here in a minute, it can interact with this thing that we call a grid queue. And a grid queue is just another service that also happens to support the basic execution services interface. But it can toss the job to that and say, you figure out, it can delegate responsibility of that job to this other service, and then it can send it to another BES somewhere else. So what we're trying to convey in this picture is there's there's two essential models, and in, in the architectural response document, it talks about this. I took this from there. It says you can either directly interact with basic execution services, or you can interact through other services in this case, a grid queue, that will itself interact with back-end um, basic execution services for you. So this particular one is called a grid queue, and um, I'm going to talk about grid queues really briefly, and then I want to, actually, I'm going to stop for a second. Are there any questions so far? Marlon, we st am I still talking to you? Oh, yeah, yeah, we're all here. Right. heard a noise. Well, yeah, you know, no the phone could have died. Yeah, no, no questions also on the chat, so, yeah. Okay, so how do you run one of these jobs? Once again, I'm going to talk about this through the command line tools, but it can also be done through APIs, and there's actually other mechanisms, but let's focus on it. The basic thing that you want to do is run a job. I want to run one job. This is the most primitive thing. It, it will. You give it a JSDL file and a BES. So here I said... I'm going to highlight this so you can see it. You give it a name that you want to call the job. This particular job is going to be done uh, 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 asynchronously. Actually, let's start at the bottom. The bottom one is a synchronous job run. I'm telling it I want to run the job. Um, I want to run it on this basic execution service. Remember I said I can assume you guys know what path names are. 
we name execution services or any basically any service in um, EMS or the GFFS by a path name. In this case, home, I, this one, this example I'm using, it's home, Vana, my best. So, he, so she has a link to a basic execution service she wants to use and call her my best. This could be a link to TAC if that's what she wanted, or it could be an execution service if she started herself. So she's saying run the, a job on this execution service, and here's the job submission description language document that I want you to use. And it says on the local file system at that particular path. And this will do what's called a synchronous job execution. It will start the job, it will block and wait for that job to either complete or fail, and then it, it will um, return the code. Oftentimes you want to do an asynchronous run. So I can do the same thing. I say I want it to be asynchronous. I give it the name of a file that doesn't exist right now in the, in the namespace that the system will create, and it's a file that I can then read period. I can basically read because it's a file, and it will have the job state in it, so I'll know when it's done. So it'll go immediately to, um, for instance, staging in, and then it will turn the staging into executing, and eventually it would be staging out, and then it would get to finished, or maybe it would go to failed. And then once again, I say the name of the JSDL. So here's the simplest things you can do. Run a synchronous job, run an asynchronous job. And if I do it asynchronously, once I've done this, I'm done. I can just turn around and I can check the status using check status on the um, on the file that I, I asked the system to create. So that's the command line. It's the simplest way to do anything. It will use the security context uh, that's defined, and, and away you go. Still no questions. I'm a little surprised. Okay. So a couple things about when the jobs are running. When the jobs are running um, in a basic execution service, they're running in what's called a working directory. And sometimes uh, uh, some of the uh, some documentation I've seen from Unicor refers to this as a session directory. It's the same thing. When the job is started up, it's going to have a, uh, a working directory into which if you don't specify a path, all stage in will go into and all stage out will come out of if you don't specify a particular path. So what's going to happen is it's going to get scheduled on the best. The best will create a unique working directory for it. For example, in our implementation, we have a subdirectory called activities, and then each of the jobs, it's not job one, it's actually it's a, it's a key, but it doesn't matter. And inside of there is a working directory. And so when we do the staging, we copy all the data uh, into that directory that you've asked to be staged in, and when you're completed, we copy everything out um, uh, that you request to be copied out. So I keep talking about JSDL. It's a standard from the Open Grid Forum, just like basic execution services are. You specify jobs in JSDL. It's an XML-based language. Um, there's lots of implementation, uh, lots, several people using uh, JSDL in one form or another. Because it's an XML-based language, I would argue fundamentally it's not intended for human consumption, um, but it does make it easy to you know, have simple code generators that will generate it. Um, a JSDL document has a bunch of pieces. It has, and this is not a JSDL tutorial, by the way, um, has an identity section, an application description, the resource requirements um, section, and then uh, data staging. And let me uh, just briefly do this. So here's a, a JSDL document. It's got a job description, which is basically I've, it's going to be called an adder. Um, it has some resources that it's uh, asking for. Uh, here it says it needs to be a Linux operating system. Uh, the application part is in the sub, there's another subspec on uh, POSIX application. And it says, okay, the, act, uh, the executable is called adder.sh. Um, it wants to send the output to standard out, and it's going to take two arguments, 7.dat and 42.dat and sum.dat um, and 10. I don't remember what this does. So the idea is that you basically specify uh, what it is, and once again, this is really not for human consumption. And so for the most part, um, we our user community, uh, at least here, rarely deal with End users are not intended to ever be dealing with JSDL, just not done. Um, uh, we have a tool 
that will allow you to create it. If you guys are interested in seeing the tool, I can show you. The tool allows you to create uh, and then save uh, uh, in a GUI and then save JSDL or save what we call a grid project file so that you can um, muck with it later. Um, it's pretty much um, what you would expect for a tool. You can have raw text files and edit them. I've written shell scripts before that generate jobs by taking a basic uh, uh, JSDL file and then said scripting certain parts of it to be different to do my essentially my own parameter sweeps, um, but uh, you don't have to do that. So that was the basics of remote execution. You define the job in JSDL, including the staging element, what you want to execute, in other words, the command line, uh, what staging you want to do, what notifications you're going to want, uh, whether it's a sequential or parallel job, and um, and whether it's a parameter sweep or not. Then what you do is uh, you send it to a basic execution service or a grid queue. It does your job. You can check the results. That's pretty much it. Very straightforward. So before I go into where how gateways and workflow managers are supposed to fit into this architecture, are there any questions on that? Okay. So this is the execution management systems architecture for doing higher level services. If you read the, do the docs, which I don't necessarily expect anybody to do, it borrowed pretty heavily um, from the OGSA, um, Execution Management Services Architecture. And in that architecture, there were these things called basic execution services, which you would send JSDL documents to, and it would do what we just talked about. However, when we're doing the architecture, we realize that that clients may want to have other kinds of services than just executing a job. And that these other services in their job interaction may not be communicating with an end user using JSDL. In fact, they may never be doing something like that. And we explicitly managed, imagined a type of service called a job manager, which does not have necessarily any standard interface to the outside world at all. It could be a gateway or a web program that is gathering information from people, what files that they want to use, maybe building a workflow, doing this all in its own internal representation of the problem. And only when it talks to the EMS architecture will it be spitting out JSDL documents to talk to the different sites. So, in, in, the, in the architecture document, there's several types of job managers that we imagined. One would be a grid queue. Uh, another one might be a workflow engine. Uh, another one might be a, uh, a, a broker that's trying to get the best quality of service for you in terms of either cost or performance or whatever. We don't know what all the different things that people might want to create job managers for and what their interfaces will be. And so, the architecture is not in the business of mediating the interaction between the client who's using some tool. It could be the web browser, it could be, you know, we're not in the business of specifying that. And this thing that we call a job manager, which is really just the location for some thing that somebody else wrote that's doing something that users want, and I know that's incredibly vague, um, but then that talks to back end basic execution services to do what we want. So this is the overall execution management system architecture and the role that job managers fit into. And at least in my mind, most of the gateways and most of the uh, things like workflow engine tools will fall into the job manager category, where we're not trying to define how they do this part, um, the interaction with the client, but how they do the back end part. Hey, Andrew, let me stop you for a minute. Brock, yeah. you, had a, you had a question? Yeah, I have a question, um, and I might have missed this because I was kind of doing multiple things while I was watching and listening. Um, <clears throat> so the, the JSDL, you guys are going to send everyone kind of like a format, format, like what was expected? So JSDL is a standard, um, and it's been out for a long time. Um, it's it uh, You could read the spec. It's, it's like a lot of specs, not particularly exciting to read. Right. Um, the... Uh, there's a, a bunch of papers that have been written about people using JSDL. Um, there, there is a spec. We have a tool that will generate JSDL for you. Um, I mean, I, I understand that, but um, and 
you know, forgive me, I'm not, you know, as um, I'm not an expert in this this world. I'm more actually on the web service and the building the the, the client side things. You guys mm -hmm. are not in the stuff I'm looking at, but I'm just I'm assuming that on this this architecture that you're going you're expecting some kind of specifications coming across in this document, right? You're looking for some parameters. Yeah. So in, specifically in the JSDL document, we are looking for. Let me. Uh, and, that, and that's what I was talking about. Like, what are you guys looking for? Like, what are you expecting on your end that's to be submitted, you know, via right. this document? So this is a, a sample JSDL document. You guys should be able to see. It's in the. It's in the. Uh, the GFFS, and you can get to it. We expect that there will be a job identification, like I've highlighted here. What's it called? And that's important because later on, when you're looking for your job, um, this is the handle you're going to. This is the human-based handle you might want to have to identify what you're talking about. Right. This particular job is saying the application is a POSIX application. It's going to run something called hostname.sh and output some stuff. So if you want to, for instance, redirect standard out or standard error or redirect standard in, that you would need to tell us that you want to do that. Okay. Uh, you need to tell us what resources you want. Because if you don't specify that you want to have an x86 or Linux, then in principle you're saying, I don't care if you put me on Windows. Right. And, you, and usually some people care. Right. Um, and then if you want to move data in or out, you provide the, this data staging sec section, which can have as many data staging elements as you want. So we're looking for a document that looks like this. Okay. That's, yeah, that, that, was, that was my question. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I like to think of it as sort of like JCL on steroids, for those of you who are old enough to remember um, job control language from the 70s. <laughs> Probably not a lot of you, but um, anyway. Any other questions? Okay. It turns out that several JMs have been developed already. Um, that and fit in this model and can be used as sort of an indicator of how you might want to proceed to do these kind of things. One is called Andrew, the grid queue. Question? Andrew, uh, so yeah, so you mentioned this uh, BESS, uh, the uh, uh, execution services, basic right. execution services. Is, is it a, a common thing that uh, is presented at every site or is it a site specific thing or? No. Okay, so BES is a standard, it stands for Basic Execution <clears throat> Service. Um, at each of the SPs, there's a, a service, a, B, a BES running, um, that they're running an implementation from uh, the Unicor uh, group in Germany. And so you can directly access through the BES interface, sort of uh, uh, as I showed in, let me, in this model, you can uh, directly talk to a BES if that's what you want to do. Okay, in fact, here there's a Unicore 6.1 that's showing it in NCSA. I don't think that's actually true. I don't think that's <coughs> NCSA has one. Um, so yeah, there will be one, or not will be, there is one, uh, a basic execution service at SDSC, at TAC, on in front of Stampede. There's one um, at IU in front of Mason. There's one at Pittsburgh in front of uh, Blacklight. Actually, there's one in Uqueen in in Germany, if 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 you care. Um, and uh, then there's also one. So I see uh, seven registered. Okay, is that Warren? Services. Sounds like yeah, Warren. Hey. Yeah. Um, and and there's more. And then there's also uh, BES endpoints that aren't in the the registry. Um, there's one or two at the University of Virginia on one machine called Rivana, and another uh, another one another cluster. Um, and those are the ones that I'm aware of right now. Oh, there's one in Germany too. Yeah. So these services are uh, run by the admin. The services may or may not be run by the admins. The Unicore 6 endpoints. Um, Unicore 6 requires one of its components to run as root, and therefore the admins have to bring it up and, and service it. Um, the Genesis 2 endpoints run as a user level process, and so they don't require an admin. To, anybody can run a Genesis 2 endpoint. Um, 
but yes, they are run by the admins uh, at the sites. Yeah, I think in that scenario, it's kind of like uh, you know how the Globus Gram works. Hmm. Yeah, it's a service everyone can use. It's fitting the exact same role. It's just a standard interface. Yep. Now, I, think I did a, a web search for Exceed BEF endpoints, and the second link came up with uh, the list I found. But we should probably have a better way to tell people where those are. Yeah, I mean, the way I find the ones that we can, uh, that will do the interop, um, is I, I actually just look in, in the directory. That's because I have the GFFS up. I can go to a resources directory here and go to exceed. Oops, that's users, wrong directory. Resources, exceed.org. And this tells me that there's one on Blacklight, um, one on uh, Gordon, Mason, Stampede. Yeah, either Trestles or Gordon is down right now, I'm pretty sure. We're not, not accepting. And I can also just look at what, what's in the various queues. So there's a, a several ways to discover, but they are on the resources. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Before I... Also, I, I just see um, if you go to the Exceed portal in the user guides, there's one uh, software guide for Unicore that could be helpful. I don't see one for GFFS or for Genesis, though. There, there, there is one for GFFS it, uh, that they put in. I, it needs to be modified, in my opinion. But yeah, that's why I would. If you want to learn how to use the the EMS and the uh, and the other services, you're probably better off going to our documentation right now. We're having a documentation lag with uh, AC. Okay, so there's several of these JMs that have been built. One's a grid queue, which I'm going to briefly. Um, it's going a little slow. We have a Dagman workflow engine. Uh, Aravada um, uh, has been done using the, the uh, APIs with the Unicore 6 uh, guys. There's another workflow uh, gateway uh, engine tool that you guys are probably more familiar with than I am called GU's WSP Grade. Um, they've uh, done uh, one of these. At one point, there was a Kepler and a Chain one, but I'm not sure of their status. The interesting thing about GU's and P Grade is it took us about a day and a half to port that to using Exceed. And it was particularly easy for them because they were internally already using JSDL uh, and the BES interfaces. And so for them, it was it was a really trivial matter to, to switch their stuff over. So Andrew, this is Matt. So I have a question for you. Uh, the Dagman works engine. I, I, I was under the impression that that was an old version and that wouldn't work with, with uh, version 6. Do you have better information than that? Well, so I don't know which Dagman you're referring to. Um, so this is a, uh, a tool that got developed um, three years ago. Oh, okay. Not part of the Exceed stack. Okay. And it takes um, um, Dagman-style definitions, uh, graph um, definitions, and, and the ability to do subgraphs. And as the endpoints, instead of having Condor CDL files, it uses JSDLs. But it does essentially the same thing. Okay. That was confusing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, um, buh, 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 buh. right. So the grid queue, I'm going to try to finish this up. Um, the grid queue is just an instance of a job manager. It looks like uh, any other queuing system that you're used to. You submit jobs to the queue. Sorry about the noise. It keeps a list of the BESs that are available for it to schedule on and the capabilities of them, and it basically does matchmaking. And it monitors progress through completion. Um, and there's, uh, uh, it's what you pretty much would expect a, a grid queue to do. So user submits a job, they go into the queue, they get match -make, match -make, matched with a resource of some kind of vest that's running somewhere, the job gets run, um, and uh, it will be retried a number of times. So the next two slides I don't intend you to read, but just to sort of give you the feeling of. So you can queue sub to it, you can query it, you can reschedule a job. One of the things we've discovered over the years is sometimes things get scheduled on a machine and get stuck in a queue and you want to change your mind where you want it to go. 
Um, you can QSTAT, um, and uh, uh, then you can configure the queue, kill jobs, queue list, that kind of groovy stuff. Of course, there's a GUI for it. Um, and, and sort of that's what I wanted to get through today is this high-level picture. I want to go back to the high-level picture of where we see um, gateways and and, uh, and other tools like that fitting is, is that they will develop something. And I'm calling it a client because from our perspective, it's a client. It might uh, uh, be something you've done. There's some job manager, which somebody else writes and is doing whatever they want to do and, in fact, may be talking to other types of services out the side end. But when they want to talk to us, they just send us these standard documents, these JSDL documents, to the basic execution service. And they can, you know, if they want to send them at the web services level and build their own, you know, WSDL, more power to them. Um, that's not an easy way to interact with most things. Usually you end up using uh, uh, some Java stub that's uh, written around that, and which is what we recommend, or just using the command line, because uh, that's simple, easy, and simple. Use the command line tools uh, to either send jobs to BESs or to one of the grid queues. So I'm going to stop there. I can do a demo, um, but I, I really want to make sure I answer your questions about the fundamentals. Do we have questions for Andrew? So I have one, and or this is sort of an umbrella question, but it's about uh, how you handle errors. So when you run a, if you're running a gateway long enough, you're going to see all kinds of yeah. errors. The the machines acting up, uh, something's wrong with PBS, uh, uh, hardware failures, file system problems. Some user provides that just provides bad input. All all sorts of things like that. Lots and, of things can go wrong. Yeah. So right now. Um, one of the, the – there's there's two answers to that. One is um, the status that you get back um, can have a small amount of information, but the more interesting answer to that question – I mean, you'll find out what state, you know, it ended in. I'm trying to find the right, uh, the right command here. You configure to kill. Okay, I didn't copy the command in. Um, there's a command which may be in there, and I'm just not seeing it because I'm in too much of a hurry. Q7, you reschedule Q stat. I, I, I must. See, there's a, there's a way I can show it. It's probably easier um, that you can uh, find out the history of a, a job. There are command line tools to get job history as well, and the job history that's kept. Exit this and re-enter. Um, so. That went to error. Right. The job history um, is is a is a text file that you can analyze and it will tell you what exactly happened and you can also get what the exit code was. But typically what we found is things like something can't stage out or can't stage in because there's been an I.O. problem along the way. It's really useful to know. And you can look at the details of what happened. Now right now these are in a non-standard format and one of the activities that we've proposed to um, we being SDNI and our, our group and the ULIC group, is there's now a standard definition of what the job history should look like. That came from the JSDL group. And we would like to switch to using um, a standard representation of that. Um, and, and furthermore, this is, uh, I don't know if this is going to, uh, no, that's not going to help. The other thing that you can do, um, I didn't want to get into trying to show the fancy stuff, but there's also going to be a way to um, attach to the job history uh, through the file system so that you can treat it just like a file and you could tail dash after the job history so you could know how things are going on. Um, but that is going to, you can do that right now in Genesis 2. There's now a standard that's uh, come out of, on how that will be interfaced. 
but uh, Unicore 6 needs to implement that, which basically means it needs to be prioritized to implement it. But right now, the standard set of faults for BESs are there, and then the exit um, uh, history is, is the best way to find out in detail what exactly went wrong, what was the actual error that occurred. And, and Marlon, I don't know if you, it's not even just that PBS went up. Sometimes it's just that suddenly, you know, some file copy won't work, or you need to know exactly which part of this thing it failed, and that's why we have job history. Great. Other questions? Yeah, there's it. If it was the non zero exit code, you'd get it right there. That doesn't always tell you what you want to know, but it's something. So another question, uh, when you're when you're working with workflows and you you're chaining chaining inputs to out, uh, outputs to inputs and so forth, one of the um one of the difficulties is uh, the simple question of, you know, is the job done? Is the job finished yet? So how do you how do you interact with the system to determine the job is uh, job is completed? Right. That's that. So first off, um, the BES standard has a uh, an interface uh, called uh, uh, get activity status, and you can pass it either a single job handle or a vector of job handles, so that you can get a whole bunch at once instead of getting getting them one at a time. Right. Um, the uh, let me see if I can. The other way you can, uh, and so you can always find that out that way, and there are command line tools to say get job status. Um, you can also, if I look uh, in here at my jobs, um, I think they're the finished jobs. I can click on a file called status. Oh, I don't, that's not my. Um, and I can find out uh, what happened to the job uh, as it was going. Oh, these ran on uh, Unicore 6 endpoints, so I don't have the actual status. But in general, you just call get activity status on the command line, give it the job, uh, the handle you got back when you created the job, and it will tell you whether, where it is in the, in the, uh, the BES defines a state model and a state sub model, and there's uh, terminal states are, are um, Error um, and finished. Okay, other questions? By the way, this thing that I've been bringing up, this is the GUI that shows the, the overall GFFS namespace. And if when you log on, um, you'll have a home directory that uh, well, the easiest way to get to your home directory is to just say, you know, I want to go to my home directory. And this is my home directory in the CGFFS. Um, because you can stage data directly into and out of the GFFS. And so, for example, down here, this is my work directory on Stampede. And I can have jobs directly stage data into this work directory on Stampede. In fact, that's what I was doing earlier today is having testing some stuff out that goes into there. Similarly, you can grab data directly out of these um, things that are called exports. So here's my, ex I have an export on uh, at Pittsburgh, I have one in Germany, this is one in, in Stampede. I have them on my desktop. Um, so you can stage data directly in and out of your desktop if that's what you want. Um, and, uh, and that's all there is to it because when you're creating a job, like I was here a minute ago, uh, if I say create job, I can, in the JSDL, let me open a JSDL file. Let me open this one. So this is a program that's going to call hostname. There's nothing to it. We all know what hostname does. Um, it's going to call bin hostname. I could put arguments in and environment variables. Um, this, I think, is much easier than generating JSDL by hand. Um, what your input, outputs, and errors are going to do, what files you want to stage in. Here I'm staging out into the transfer protocols that we support for staging our um, HTTP, um, the grid GFFS namespace, FTP, SCP, mail to, and grid FTP. And you basically give the staging URI and how you want it to copy data in and out, and it will do all that for you. You can specify what resources you want to use, um, Linux, 
Xenix, whatever floats your boat, memory, the usual kind of stuff if it's a parallel job information about that. And then um, it also does parameter sweeps. So I have a variable I define called numbered. I happen to only over one over one or two. You can have as many variables as you want, and then you can use them in, uh, like here on staging out, I have dollar number dot text as the output. So you can basically um, have parameter sweeps over multi-dimensional spaces where they can be ordinal spaces like integers, they can be floating point spaces, but they can also be enumerated spaces. Like I could define a space to be red, yellow, green, blue, orange, and then it will iterate over ye yellow, whatever the colors are I just said. Um, Brock, it, yeah, generate. Brock, you had a question again? Uh, yeah, sorry, and I apologize. Maybe you guys covered this earlier. Um, back to the uh, the web service thing, um, <clears throat> you know, sending stuff through this JSPL document. Um, I'm assuming, you know, in order to get data submitted, you would need some sort of authentication. So it would be the user has access to it. How, how does authentication happen? Let's say I'm building a service. How mm -hmm. is it brokered between the service I build and submitting that job? That's why, yeah, we, we covered that um, early on. The okay. execution management services uses what's called a credential wallet model. And you keep in your wallet, which sometimes I think of the wallet as basically your security context. And then the security context is generally within a larger thing we call a calling context. And so you acquire uh, credentials that go into your wallet. If you're using Exceed to do this as backend services, you need to have used uh, a call called Exceed Login, which um, first acquires the My Proxy Session Certificate that you're going to use, and then all of your other credentials will be delegated to that session certificate. So basically, you get a calling context. If you're uh, in the simple case where you're using command lines, you just would have a different directory for each user. And every time you interact with that, you would set an environment variable to change uh, where the, which calling context it will use. You can also add your own groups and identities. And so what that ends up looking like, in this case I did it in exceed login, it got my my proxy credential, and then I did a who am I, and I, it, you can see that I have my my proxy credential and three delegated credentials to that. There's API versions in Java of this stuff right now as well, if you wanna uh, maintain multiple security contexts at a time. All right, yeah, I apologize for that. I, I came in a little late. I was having issues. That's fine. That's fine. Appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I have one more question. Uh, so if, if people on the call are interested or have users that they interact with that would be interested in using uh, the services, what kind of, uh, besides the documentation and so forth, what kind of support is available? Right. So we have, uh, you can send in a ticket and it will come to us. Um, we also have office hours twice a week. I don't remember what they are, where there's somebody available to answer your questions on Skype. Um, uh, we have a, a person named Vana who does that, Vana Mala, although she's going to India for a, a while, but we'll still we'll figure out how to handle that. Um, the other thing is um, I we're going to be doing a, a general tutorial, I think the second week in May. It's a four-hour online tutorial through Exceed Training Services. That might be a good way to do it. There's also all of these um, video uh, uh, videos you can watch that I showed you all earlier um, that basically give you the basics of the, the namespace, which is the GFFS, how to use the client, how to, if you want to install a container and what the differences are between all these things. But for a simple job, you know, you just watch this tutorial and it takes you through how you do it every single step and i think on the other side um at least unicore bes's are all in production so any problems there you can put a ticket in and the sps will will go and fix it that's that's the that's true for almost any of this stuff if you're having a problem you send in a ticket if you want to sort of learn more these are the kind of resources you can go to yeah, no, I just re wanted to reassure folks because it may not always be clear and exceed which things are in production and which aren't, and these are. All right, we're at the top of the hour. I'll, I'll uh, ask one more uh, chance for questions or comments. Okay. All right, so um, 
uh, before we go, uh, uh, and thanks, Andrew. Give me back uh, our release, your presenter status, so I can stop the recording. Thank you. And for, yeah, not quite yet. Yeah, here we go. All right. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Okay. Great. Right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone.